where we are today is a direct continuity of where we've been in the past. So we're going to basically tell the story of Richmond. We're going to tell the story of exactly where we are by a series of maps that are going to cover all these years. Now, right now, what we're doing is we're flying up the James River, as it would have been before human habitation. As you might imagine, we didn't actually find this footage somewhere. This is a, a computer simulation of what it would have been. And you'll see what our winding river is like. In 1607, as soon as the English decided that this was where they were going to establish their foothold in the New World, they, they arrive in, in, at the Chesapeake Bay and then row up here days later. And they believe they're going to find a passageway across whatever body this is. And along the way, they meet the people they call the naturals, they call American Indians, who welcome them and bring them on shore. And they come, and instead of finding a shining city somewhere, they find these rocks out here. And they hear this roar, and they realize that this is as far as they're going to be able to go. Now, as it turns out, this had long been a place where different peoples had met, sometimes warred, traded, bargained. To the south of us, to the, to the east of us, the Powhatan. To the west of us, the Monacan. And in between, Shaco, an English version of the rock of where the creek runs into the James. And at that point, there had been exchange for a thousand years before the English came. And they recognized that this is an important boundary. And they put the uh, uh, cross up, and you can see it right outside this building, that signals, they tell the American Indians, a friendship between their king, Powhatan, and Christopher Newport, who come there. Didn't fully explain what the cross might mean. You might think then, ah, they look around, they say, there's enough water power here to, to drive a hundred of the mills we have back in England. But they don't. It's six generations of English settlement before they come here. Now, it's not for lack of understanding of what, what they're seeing because this is going to be, not that, but the next thing. <laughs> this. And what you see here is this, John Smith is with Christopher Newport on that first day. And when he comes and he marks here on the first map we have of Virginia, the falls. And so they know from the beginning. You can see it says the fall. It also says Powhatan. And there's an image of Powhatan and his kingdom that's based here. And for the next hundred years, plantations grow all along that river that I showed, up and down all the creeks. They bring in thousands and thousands of people from Africa to grow a crop that they eventually discover of tobacco. And their eyes are resolutely set to the east, to the Atlantic to England, to the big market out there. Out here are more Indians, more wilderness. They don't know what's going to happen. So we need to realize that as long as it took for them to come to what seems to us now the center of the universe, here in Richmond, Virginia, but they didn't discover it for a while. When they do come, William Byrd is finally pushed and determined that you should draw up a town there. We're, we're allowing you to do that. We insist, in fact, that you do that. And so he actually draws up the first uh, plan of the city of Richmond. And what he really does is just lay down a grid on top of the irregular hills that we have here that are, uh, it, it's poorly suited to this. As you can see, just the squares. And you can see the creeks there. But he says, no, nah, how, about, how about these squares? And it's not really very well settled for a long time. Uh, and his son, uh, becomes bankrupt and actually tries to sell these lots in a lottery, but fails and commits suicide in 1777. And after he does, a small town slowly grows up here. And this is what it looks like around 1809. There's a few skirmishes here, but why does it grow like this? Because they decide this should be the capital of the new state of Virginia. And Thomas Jefferson designs the first neoclassical building in America and puts it there on the hill. It's named Richmond because the view from what's now Chimborazo Hill looks like the Thames that William Byrd remembers from his youth in England. And he wishes that's what it could be like rather than the muddy, flood-prone big rock with a creek 
here that they're trying to make this town on. But 1780, make it the capital. It starts growing. And what you see here is the, uh, on, this, on this map of, of, of Richmond at the time, that it is two features I want to call your attention to that remind us that there is uh, often more than one history going on at the same time. What happens at that armory down on the river is the, what would have been the first major slave revolt in American history takes place. Gabriel gathers at what's now Bryan Park, and they gather at the creek where the water is loud so that they can conceal what they're planning. And they are going to take President, uh, Governor James Monroe and hold him hostage, and they're going to seize the armory down near the James, and they are going to hold those Hold him hostage until all enslaved people are set free. And the plan grows and it becomes compelling. But then an enormous storm comes and washes out the bridges and the connections and someone breaks and tells about the rebellion. And over 20 of the conspirators are hanged all around the city. And Gabriel is hanged and buried right below what's now I-95 and what's called the, the Negro Burial Ground. So, well, and it, it's, it was called at the time the Negro Burial Ground. And what you find then is that at the very next to that same armory is the thing that is also another future of the city, of the canal that's born at the same time. Because they had this audacious idea, a very TEDx sort of idea. What we need to do is actually have a water connection all the way to the Ohio River from here. Sure, we got stuck at the canal, I mean, at the, the falls the first day, but now maybe we'll be able to make it beyond it. And what they have in mind is that you will actually tap the power here of these falls and also remove the major impediment. Because all along now, the uh, settlement has been going above and beyond the city. If they had a place with all of the bounty, of all up the James, all the way to the Blue Ridge Mountains, could find a way to come here, and then they put on ships and shipped out this city could become something remarkable. George Washington helps design that. And by 1809, it's flourishing. And a, a city of 5,000 grows up around it with free black people, enslaved people, and uh, artisans, and, and it's growing all around. But what you see right there, there are two histories going on. That at the same time that the city is booming in many ways, there are also the people held in slavery here have their alternative history, an alternative geography, in which they are working at every step of the way to make themselves free in every way that they can. Now, the city that we know begins to grow in the 1850s. So you saw the canals, there's the capital, and you'll see that the other uh, neighborhoods that you come to know and love were all established by the time of the, the 1850s. And what you see is that there's Oregon Hill, which is called Oregon Hill because it's so far to the west. They thought nobody would ever go there. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's where it came from, the Hollywood Cemetery, which is designed as a very modern sort of place where you'd want to spend eternity. There is uh, the uh, Chimborazo Hill and Church Hill are all developing up along these places. And, the, and Manchester is growing. But the big thing that happens that is a, a change is and there's a Tredegar Ironworks, one of the most modern places in America to build locomotives. But there is the big change there, which are the railroads. The railroads connect Richmond north and south, east and west. But one of the things that it does by connecting Richmond to north and south and east and west, it makes us the leading flour producer in the, in the United States. Flour is being shipped from here, right here, right along this canal. Right now we're pinned between the canal and the river. And that's because all along here they would have created this kind of landscape in order to take advantage of the water power to drive the mills. But one of the other things they did too, those same railroads helped turn Richmond into one of the leading slave markets of the United States. The leading port of where people would be taken from their families all throughout the Piedmont area and Maryland, brought here, put in holding cells, dressed, marked, insured, and then sold, and then put on those railroads and shipped throughout the, the entire southeast. And so Richmond, even though it cannot grow cotton, becomes an integral part. And here within the side of the, the gleaming capital is the slave trade that is uh, the dark spot on Richmond's history. Now, 
as that develops, and you might have noticed that we, what we have here is an, an unusual configuration of the computer that wasn't there when I uh, started the day. So it's, uh, it's fun to see what happens. Now, the same things that, <laughs> it's just like history. It's full of surprise. You can never w tell what's going to happen. So one of the things that happens, of course, ironically, because Richmond can, t can make a railroad, can, can build locomotives, can make armors, and because it is such a, a, a diverse place and it's booming place and such a modern place, that when the southern states of the Confederacy decide they're going to create a new nation, they come to Richmond, they try to sweet talk Virginia, which is very reluctant to join the Confederacy. Into doing so, they say, Richmond can be the New England of this new nation, the fourth richest economy in the world. Come join us. And Richmond does. And over the coming years, as a result, you can see this article in the uh, New York newspapers showing all the fortifications around the city. What had been a beautiful city that was going to uh, prosper indefinitely now is a place where uh, the war rages. And And you can see here in a, in a map that you can buy that lists all the fortifications that surround the city. And what you see is that it basically becomes an armed camp. And all around the city, the city itself is transformed. What we're coming up on here in, uh, in just a few weeks is the anniversary of the Richmond Bread Riot, in which, in which uh, thousands of women gather in the... Uh, the, the streets of Richmond to demand that they have decent priced bread. The other things you see are young women and girls are put to work building ammunition and armaments and they blow up on Belle Isle. And the, the factories right along here that had been the sign just a few years ago of great promise now become giant prisons, Libby Prison. And so a, a huge break in the history of the city. But what you're seeing here too is all around the city is African Americans held in slavery use this moment to seize whatever moment they, of freedom they can. Each of these red dots is an episode of engagement of African Americans with the Union Army and efforts to make themselves free. And the, the stories are remarkable about what it is that they can uh, do with that. And, but but it's also remarkable is that as the Confederates recognize that slavery is dissolving all around them, that they are the object of attack by the Union Army from the, the North and the South, is that the Confederates decide that once Petersburg falls, they must flee. And in order to keep the Union from gaining the resources that they have stored, they set them on fire, and all the area in red here on the screen are burned. And you'll see, we would be right <laughs> in the middle of the fire here ourselves. And so the city is basically huge parts of it taken to the ground. Then is what's going to happen. How is the city going to rebuild? And it does, remarkably rapidly. A lot of what we think of as uh, Richmond today, old Richmond, was in fact built after Reconstruction. A lot of people sort of say, Richmond's such a charming old city, but most of it's only 100 years old. And here's a remarkable thing. With nothing but the shirts on their backs, the enslaved population of Richmond make remarkable progress and build businesses throughout the, the city. And there are hundreds of them. Now, the other thing that's interesting is this is the first electric streetcar in the world here in Richmond. And what's interesting is that you are sitting in the power plant that was built to drive it. That's why this is here. 1899, the first electric streetcar. And you can see where the streetcar runs. It runs out to the west. It creates the fan. It creates the west end. And I'm sure it would run to short pump today uh, if we still had streetcars. Now, as the... And one of the things it creates are the beautiful subdivisions out at the west end. So this is Windsor Farms. And it, it also helps, however, lead to the... Monument Avenue. And what you can see here is when it was first designed, it was a real estate development. And they thought, wouldn't it be great we could sell all these lots around these buildings, around these statues. And so what we imagine now is sort of being this organic connection to the past, in fact, was something that was invented in the 1890s was a real estate development. And all of Monument Avenue was that same mixture that we see in Richmond of the combination of the future and the past in ways that's sometimes hard for us to untangle. 
And here's one example. Even as the streetcar led to all this development, it also led to the segregation of the city more and more. So the areas that I showed you before, the red area, this is an area where they come into the city and divide it up into all the different kinds of people who live there. They literally say, best people, pretty good people, not so good people, and this is all for real estate development. So even as the city develops, it also becomes ever more divided. This shows the city growing, following the suburbs to the north uh, and, and to the west in 1930s. People imagine a different kind of Richmond. They imagine that you could establish the view from the capital down to the James again, but this is never built. Instead, what is built is this, which is they, like cities all across America, they said, you know what would be a great idea? It was to be, drive huge interstate highways through the middle of our city. Uh, <laughs> And one advantage of that would be that we would be able to remove a lot of substandard housing, which just happens to be where poor people live and happens to be where the places where African Americans live. And one of the things you saw there, they, the, the city stands ex, ex, expands steadily to the west, annexing, annexing more white people, trying to annex some tax base. And you can see by 1970 that expanding deeply into what would have been Chesterfield County. So in many ways, this is the, the Richmond that we've inherited now, that the, if you look at a, a map of where poverty is in Virginia, you'll see that we're fortunate. The, the pinker it is, the poorer it is. You'll see that Richmond's a part of the band that stretches from northern Virginia through Richmond down to Hampton Roads. And we're fortunate to be in a place where there are some very wealthy counties. But as that zooms in, what you will see is that so the same patterns that have been there from, for hundreds of years, built around slavery, built around segregation, are still patterning and constraining our city today. But there is hope. One of the things that we are doing is reclaiming our connection to, this, to the river. Right where we are today is a place where people are imagining all the different kinds of connections and fun that you could have, as well as the way that tourism could be connected. So here's the message that I want you to think about as you go forward. Creativity is not just looking to the future and forgetting the past. What our city has that makes it special is the history that we have shared. It is in many ways a tragic history, a history of sudden twists and turns, a history of surprises, a history of multiple histories going on at the same time. What does that mean? It means that we can now reinvent Richmond one more time. It's been reinvented over and over again. Let's do it again on purpose with the idea of rebuilding the beautiful historic heart of our city, reconnecting to the river that is our glory, connecting to the best of what our past has been, connecting with each other, coming together in places like TEDx, RVA, and finding one another and finding ways that we can both redeem and build upon the history that we've shared. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>